Welcome to Renner Art Gallery. Uh, you probably know this already, but I need to tell you that I'm Ken Morgan. I'm from the class of 71 at Bethany College. And, uh, and um, born in 1949. Seems like a long time ago, I guess. Well, anyway, um, this is my retirement retrospective art show. So some of the works on the wall, all the works on the wall, um, on the wall are mine. But uh, some of the uh, uh, things in the show are not necessarily works of art. So I'm going to uh, do my best at giving a, um, a tour of the show because although there were a lot of people here for the reception and I was overwhelmed uh, with the response as well as the, uh, the last lecture that happened on Sunday, um, a lot of people for great reasons couldn't be here obviously and really wanted to be here. So for those of you that were here, want to watch this again, great. And for those of you that couldn't be here, this tour is for you. In this first panel, first of all, um, I want to say that uh, this painting means a lot to me and then a lot to my parents because I painted it for their 60th wedding anniversary uh, in 1997. They're both gone now, but I used an old photograph from one of their first dates to do this uh, black and white portion. And um, it's got some symbolism going on in here. And I presented it to them, and of course, they loved it. Um, my degree from uh, WVU, my master's is up above. This is the most important thing that's framed in this show. This is my Bethany degree um, from the class of 1971. And uh, most of you know, because most of you, I think, the majority will be Bethanians. It's not just a gorgeous, beautiful uh, diploma but we get to choose the names of the people that we want to have sign it, as well as the administration um, and trustees also sign uh, our Bethany degrees. I'm sure there are other schools that have similar things, but I've never seen one, and, and uh, I'm very proud of that, for sure. Other things on this panel are some awards that I've received. I'm not gonna go into detail. I've been very lucky. Uh, I'm, I'm the luckiest. I'm one of the luckiest people I know. So how's, how about that? In this corner, um, uh, which is a very important corner to me, um, you get to meet my mentor, Wes Wagner. I came here as a biology major. I was gonna be a dentist. That was the family plan. I'd said that since I was about four years old. Uh, and uh, that, that was just what I was gonna do. And then I came uh, to Bethany and became a bio major uh, with a lot of chemistry classes and it didn't take very many days or hours for that matter to, for me to figure out what no that, that i don't think so so i'd always been really good uh, and gotten a lot of attention for art thanks to my grandmother in particular and my parents they were very um supportive of that but you know um become an artist or to study art you know you, you're going to starve you're going to all that so you didn't get a lot of uh, and this is the case today you don't get a lot of support if you if you say well you know i wanted to go to med school now i want to be an artist and all that but anyway so here's Wes wagner who i took the second semester i didn't do well academically they went on academic probation because i was miserable i wasn't interested and i wanted to go home but my parents wouldn't let me because they paid uh, the full tuition and I had to stay. They paid the full $800 for my freshman year in college. Think about that, people. Anyhow, so I signed up for this class for second semester called Art Fundamentals, taught by Wes Wagner. And the first day that I had class, when I went into it and he started talking, I knew I had met something magical for me. And Wes Wagner not only uh, became my mentor, but one of the most important people in my life for the rest of his life. Um, so that's um, what I want to make sure everybody sees. And so um, to get ready for my talk and for, to get ready for this show, I reread Tuesdays with Maury. And if you haven't read Tuesdays with Maury um, by uh, Mitch Albin, you really need to. Um, it's, it's a wonderful book. And also, Maury in his own words, Maury Schwartz was a professor at Brandeis, and Mitch um, Album was one of his students, 
and they were very close while, while Mitch was in college and for a while later, but then there was this sort of distance between them. And he, and he learned of the fact that, um, that Maury had become ill with Lou Gehrig's disease. And so um, he went to visit him and to catch up on things. And they made this plan that they would, that Mitch would, who had become very successful by the way, I'll tell you, that they would uh, get together on Tuesdays, hence the name of the book. Also, uh, after that, and this is, well, it's not new because Maury's been gone for a while, but this is Maury in his own words. I want to also recommend this. So, Wes Wagner was my Maury. And also, so was this guy, David Judy. David Judy, um, a, a, a theater person, English uh, professor, and so on, became one of my um, best friends and advocates, and really is the reason that I standing here tonight having this conversation. He uh, called me up at an inopportune time for me uh, and my wife and said, what are you doing? And I, uh, he knew that I had left Wheeling College. What are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm opening a gallery in this house, this Victorian house and whatever, whatever. He said, well, um, uh, how about, would you consider coming back and teaching at Bethany? And I thought, what? Because when I was 19, that's exactly what my friends knew I wanted to do. Not just to become a teacher, but to become a teacher at Bethany College. And yet, it seemed like that was never, ever going to happen. And now, we've made a very different decision, and now, he's calling me and asking me this. And I said, um, well, uh, I'll have to talk it over with Judy. And, uh, and uh, he said, well, give it some thought. I hope you, I hope you say yes. So I took this thought, this idea, this opportunity to Judy and, and said, uh, she said, well, I said, well, what do you think? She said, well, isn't that what you've always wanted to do? And I said, well, yeah. She said, so you're going to do it. And, and that's in a nutshell, that's, that's Judy. So these two men in different ways are my mores. And while I'm on this topic, there are some people that I've had the total joy of teaching at this place. That um, I just, I've just, and they know who they are, I think. I'll be your Maury if you'll be my Mitch or my Mitches. My students from the past, uh, I believe, know that I've had this tradition of having them sign director's chairs and one butterfly chair if they've had and when they've had a class with me. So, um, here, here are some, here are two here, there are three up there, and I have not been able to count the number of names on them, but this is my, this is my life. This, these are the people that have had an impact upon me, and I would hope and assume that I've had an impact upon them. That, after all, should and is my goal. Um, and you, what you see here is uh, there are names on the surface, but they're also on the back and on the underneath. That's a lot of names. After all, I've been teaching here for 32 years, uh, having large classes, typically of 18, um, for most of them, drawing, uh, printmaking, painting, art history, things that I love, things that I love to do. You might remember uh, Bethania's uh, Miss Nicholson. I painted this portrait, she commissioned it of her. She was one of my closest friends uh, until she passed away. Um, and over here we have Mr. Taylor, who was just the king of the dining hall, and he commissioned me to paint his portrait, and so there he is. I'm standing in front of a diptych. You know what that is? A two-panel painting, or a piece of art. It doesn't have to be painted. Um, and this was part of a show. 14 artists were invited to Huntington Galleries. Uh, the theme of the show was a sense of place, and we could interpret that in any way we uh, thought we wanted to. And what you see here in this uh, two panels are red years and white years, okay? And the red years, and this book goes with it, Tempest Fuga, and uh, Time Flies. So in here we have uh, the explanation of why the red years, 1949, the year I was born, and so on. Uh, 1955, uh, I entered the first grade, and so on. I'm not gonna go through all those. But anyway, it's kind of an interactive thing. Uh, and of course, uh, I, I do have uh, Country Roads Take Me Home around this. Uh, this uh, globe is in front, 
And as you'll see, I, I cut up maps and made my own globe. And these are the countries, special places I've been to, uh, special places I've lived, West Virginia. Of course, I'm from Southern Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, and that's, that's the story with this piece. I think that's probably enough to say about it. But uh, I was two weeks old here, and I was, um, let me think, can't do the math. I was a lot older there. <laughs> uh, and this uh, uh, panel in the center here, it could be titled as Greek to me. Uh, that's because of what I have here are composites of a fraternity that I was one of the founders of. We started as a, a sort of a local Phi Alpha chapter. Not exactly local, it's not quite the right word. But, but we were aspiring to become a chapter of Sigma Alpha Epsilon, which has been an outstanding national fraternity for a long time. Now people have all kinds of ideas and thoughts and whatever opinions about fraternity life. But for me, being an only child, which was always something I never wanted to be, but was, uh, having brothers, um, fake or real or whatever, uh, meant a lot to me. This was the class after mine, um, which because this was their 50th anniversary, uh, a homecoming, uh, was the 50th for the night class of 1972. And I had a show totally of SE uh, earlier this year, where I had uh, the class of 71 uh, featured along with other uh, uh, the SEEs uh, uh, were founded here with just a few guys. We exploded into this large, diverse group of guys. We had diversity on our side, diversity. Um, and we also had a group of little sisters. We were one of the first fraternities that actually had women sort of connected with us. Um, and uh, so, so this is a composite of SAEs. Now that said, later on, uh, SAEs uh, went away. By the time I came back here to teach, they were gone. And uh, it was known that I had been an SAE, and the Sigma Nu advisor was leaving uh, Bethany, and he uh, tried to hand a torch to me. And I was somewhat reluctant to take it. I felt kind of like that was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an SAE. But I gotta tell you something. These men, and this is just two of the composites, I was their advisor for just under 15 years. And these guys are some of the closest men in my life and most important people that I've ever known. Uh, Judy and I have been to their weddings, we've uh, been to christenings, we have celebrated all kinds of things with them. Our home has uh, been uh, something that they uh, come and, and, and share when they're in town and whatever. And uh, this past weekend was Bethany's home coming here, as you all know, and uh, we had several uh, very important drop-in guests uh, all, all during the day. And was, what can I say? Again, it's back to oh, what a lucky man. I am. Some of my family is represented here. Uh, in fact, most of my family. My, my wife, Judy, is a portrait of her in 1995. Is that what that says? Yep, that's what it says. Um, my daughter Kendall, when she was quite a young girl, we were at Nags Head where we had the vacations many, many summers. My daughter Whitney, this is a pencil drawing that I did of her. Um, my best friend is down there, it's hard to see. I'll just mention Janice Stein was my best friend on the planet. Much older than I, um, but she's a very important part of my life and, and my daughter's lives. Here we have grandkids. Uh, these are the North Carolina grandkids, Thea and Egypt. And these are the Houston, Texas grandkids, Deliana and Pax. Love these people. Great family. I do say so myself. You don't have to know me too well to know that one of my passions is travel. And I've been lucky, lucky enough to be able to do a lot of that. Thanks to my job here in particular. Um, and, and thanks to the fact that I got a travel bug. I got to go to Europe for the first time as a, uh, a high school graduation present. And we, it was one of those tours where you do like, I don't know how many countries, but it planted the seeds in me that oh, I gotta see more of the rest of the world and I gotta stay longer. So I've been lucky enough to teach a course in Italy over 20 times. Uh, I've, I've taught in uh, Paris and London, that was a, a, a one time. I have uh, been on some exotic situations, which we'll talk about 
next panel. And I'll just mention Florence, Italy, where I studied printmaking for six weeks one, one particular summer. Uh, this is the Ponte Vecchio in Florence, and I love Florence to pieces. Um, this, I'm in Rome here. This was the very first trip that I took with students, and the priest that was leading the group uh, was the uh, campus uh, uh, priest. And he invited me to come along and help with the art talk of the, of the trip. And I was thrilled to do it. What I didn't know is um, there's, there's a gypsy situation that I was, I was very naive. Uh, as much as I love this picture that I took of this beautiful woman and her beautiful, beautiful baby, the gypsies are very, very clever. Um, and, it, and I don't judge that, but you, it's, it's surprising that somehow this ended with me having, I don't know, my wallet or something like that. It's pretty crazy. I have been successfully robbed over there, but we won't talk about that today. Uh, this is a piece I did. It's called When in Rome. That's a little drawing of me I inserted there. Um, uh, Venice, of course, I think you probably recognize that, uh, even if you've never been there. And um, this is in, uh, this is a Gaudi a rooftop uh, in Madrid. Beautiful, beautiful city, and Gaudi is the finest of architects. Um, that's, of course, Dennis. There are many pictures of my groups uh, I, that I, on this old crappy suitcase that I um, have posted, and stickers of the different uh, places, destinations. Yep, it's on both ends of the mountain. There's a lot going on here. This is this is the best bar I've ever been to. It's called Botticella, and I've been to a lot of bars. Uh, and it's in Rome, near Piazza Navona, and it's run by a man named Giovanni. And he actually has some Bethany pennants, I'm assuming. You know, the, the deal is I ha we've gotten rid of January term, so I've missed it for the past oh, six years. It seems longer than that, actually. Um, and, uh, and I know a lot of things in Italy, you know, the pandemic was really rough on that beautiful country. Uh, and if you ever wanted to, this, these are uh, some of the students I took on one of the many, many trips. And gelato is one of the most delicious things I've ever eaten. Now, in this panel, it focuses on a little more, perhaps, I mean, exotic, unusual, whatever. Um, thanks to John Burns, Professor John Burns, who's one of the greatest people that I've ever worked with. Um, and he invited me to uh, go to Dominica uh, with him to help you know, with, with the trip. The person who was going to go with him had uh, a health issue and was able to not go at the last, literally the last minute. So I only had, didn't even have 24 hours um, to get ready for this thing, to go to Dominica. I didn't even know where it was. Luckily I have a globe in the living room, so I go to the globe. It's in the West Indies, and uh, St. Lucia, Lu, St. Lucia is uh, better known. Dominica, not so well known. There's a rainforest there. It's got some exotic stuff. And what it also has is um, kayaks and lots of them. So that's a, a picture from Dominica. Um, and this is um, a Dominican stink eye. I love this lady. I, I asked if I could take her picture. I loved her face. I loved her hat. And, and uh, although she allowed me, it, when, I, when, I, when I saw the picture, I thought, well, I, I don't know that she was very happy with me. Uh, so there's that. Um, now these two pictures are from the Galapagos Islands. John Burns, and, and as a result of Dominica, John Burns asked if I would travel with him to the Galapagos. It didn't take me much time, like maybe a nanosecond, to say yes, um, and I was lucky to be able to do it. It wasn't an easy trip. It was on a very small ship, not a whole bunch of people, on a rough open sea. It's crazy. This, this is a, a heron from the Galapagos. This is a marine iguana. The iguanas are amazing. And, you know, these, I, I took all these pictures, so it's not like they came from some other source. Um, and, and this is a land iguana. And this is um, Lonesome George. Lonesome George was the oldest living tortoise on the Galapagos. Um, and, and one of the oldest uh, tortoises in the world. And the poor thing, all he ever wanted was to mate. Well, you know, you can understand that. But... Um, no, no, no female uh, tortoises would ever have anything to do with them. I don't know. But look, who could, who could not like that smile, that face? This is a drawing I did, the photographs I took 
of all the different species on, in, in the Galapagos. And this is a sign, this is a, a, a Charles Darwin sign at the Institute there it's a, that I took a picture of. And then I drew the finches. These are the evolving finches. You can see that they all have uh, different shaped bills. And that's the kind of neat drawing that I did. And, and I, I wanted it to seem like a crown. Um, because, you know, for, I guess for obvious reasons. Uh, here we have another, um, two more uh, marine iguanas. This one is really quite charming. <laughs> Looks like he's ready to fight me when I took the picture. This is my first and my last uh, bullfight. I went in Madrid. I don't care for it. You pay a lot, a lot. Well, not really a lot, but to, you get to sit on a hot rock for a long time and see uh, this going on. And I learned one thing. Maybe you don't know this, but if if the uh, matador gets uh, um, hurt, they take him away and they bring out yet another, another bull. And oh my God. I mean, so we had to sit there for a very long time. That's what I'm getting to. Um, in Dominica, the, we had met this Coconut Joe guy. He was selling coconuts, walking down uh, on these rocks, walking down along the edge of the beach, the water, with a whole load of a, a sack of coconuts and a machete in his hand. So the machete was sort of like off-putting, but anyway, uh, he didn't hurt anybody. But man, he could take that, and, and one of us bought a coconut, and just crack that coconut open, and you know, the juice and all that sort of stuff. These are fur seals, Galapagos fur seals, and they, they are um, napping, as you can see. And um, anyway, I think I took some really good pictures in the Galapagos, but it's hard not to. I mean, look what you got to work with. And this is a red-headed lizard. Galapagos lizard, and uh, that's enough about Galapagos. By the way, it, everybody should go, if you ever have the opportunity or the chance. But everybody, in my opinion, should only go once, because um, they have to survive by tourism, but every tourist is a little bit of a problem ecologically. So, see it once, I'd love to do it again, but again, that would be like, I don't know. The dinghies that get you around, of course, they all run by gasoline. You can see it on the water, the rain does. It's, it's uh, concerning. Uh, I'll talk about one of my. Uh, so I've invited, I invited some students if, to see if they would um, do something, um, a portrait or, or whatever, uh, to um, to recognize us as a as a student teacher relationship. And this is Frank Pilato. A lot of people know that I love happy crazy socks and those are eyes that I paint that he um, has uh, in, been inspired by. Books uh, from classes that he took from me. I've been known to have red glasses for you know, 40 plus years and, and so he found red glasses and, but I did add and uh, Frank I, I should have asked his permission but because this is Frank and I thought well you know he's talking about all this and that way this little sculpture he created Credit Sam. So it's a collaboration. This I did a long time ago. It's called the Bible Belt. I learned when I did this. He was a, I don't get that. I mean, you don't get the Bible Belt. Fortunately, I don't live in the Bible Belt, but that's another story. Uh, in the center of this panel, I have this particular piece. It's the title of it is Tacky Tina, the Toothbrush Holder. I was invited to a, uh, create a work for a show called Form and Content. Everything had to hold something. And most of the pieces, as I remember, it's a long time ago now, um, uh, 1979, most of the pieces uh, were containers of stuff. Well, I had been working with several pieces with the rubber nose um, way before Steve Martin sort of made it even more popular. I always thought they were funny. Um, and I still think they're funny. But I'd done several pieces. So I thought, well, wait a minute. So anyway, I turned the nose upside down so the toothbrushes would fit in it. I sawed a little uh, dish that was wooden in half, so it a, a soap dish. And uh, this, and I had this fabric. It was a fabric that had been used for uh, covering some pillows. And uh, so that's Tacky Tina, the toothbrush. It was seen by um, an art reviewer, and as, as close as I came to having it, a little bit of fame. I don't want to be famous because, well, anyway, um, as far as I'm concerned, I've done all right. 
This is from Artcraft Magazine in 1980. Uh, my piece made the magazine. Uh, it's quite an interesting review of why this person thought it had such power, significance, or whatever, or charm. Because, you know, um, humorous art is probably less prevalent than a lot of other forms of art. And that's what he seemed to think about, talk about, and like. Um, a couple of drawings here. This is a Michelangelo's Vatican Pieta, and uh, what I did was I, I tore it. It's a photo I took. Um, it's in the Vatican, as I think I just said, and I tore it so that there's a negative space cross going through here, and then rented it. 2015. Um, seems like only yesterday. And this is from St. Peter in Chains. This is Michelangelo's uh, Moses. And what I did with this one, 98. What I did with this one was, because it's Moses uh, and the Ten Commandments, um, and that's the shape that I think we recognize, symbolic shape probably, of the Ten Commandments, I, I tore it into ten pieces, and because of obviously the Ten Commandments. Um, this is where, the, I, I took the students every year that we went to Florence, I took them to Space Electronic. It is. It was a discotheque, and this is where we learned how to do the Macarena and brought it back to Bethany. <laughs> and there I was up in a little cage with the students. You know, again, let me just emphasize how much fun I've had in my lifetime. And I, I've got a lot more fun to have. Uh, let me insert right here, I think it'd be appropriate. So to get ready for this, I reread Randy Pausch's The Last Lecture, which is where this concept started at Carnegie Mellon some time ago. I think it was Carney, I think it actually started there, where, where uh, professors were asked to do a last lecture. Well, uh, Randy, uh, at this point, had actually left um, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and I can't remember where he went to teach beyond that, but got a very serious diagnosis, and uh, one that he, pancreatic cancer, and one that he knew he did not probably have much time left. And he had little kids, and he had a wife. Whoa, whoa, Kenny, calm down. Um, and uh, so, so it's, it's a very moving book. I, I read it when it came out. I think it came out in 86 or something. And um, it's powerful. But, you know, I mean, his situation then and mine now. So as much as I enjoyed rereading it, it wasn't what I needed. Uh, I, I needed to figure out how am I going to put all these words together with these pieces and whatever. So there was that. So then I went back to, as I mentioned earlier, two states with Maury. Now Maury is, is a, a dying, and, and then uh, Mitch is there to, you know, cheer him up, find out things he never knew about him, and, and to appreciate him and whatever. And but, but Maury's dying. Now, and so somebody thought, well, it's also depressing. Well, first of all, I'm only 73, so I have no plans anytime soon about leaving. This place. Well, I have some thoughts about leaving Bethany, but um, so don't feel sorry for me because I've lived a great life and I'm gonna keep living until I don't know, who knows. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, this piece which was commissioned by the class of 1972 for their 20th reunion. They wanted me to paint a picture of Bethany from Greek Letter Hill. Greek Letter Hill is outside of town and we used to have wild and wonderful parties back in the day in the uh, early 70s and, and for quite some time. Um, and uh, so uh, I thought, well, that's, that's a great idea. And I had just started teaching here. I came back to teach here in 88, 89. And one class in 88 and then more in 89. I said, you know, I don't, I don't know if the students, they only talk about Greek Letter Hill. So, but I'll go on Monday. I lived in Wheeling at the time. I'll go on Monday and uh, take some pictures and uh, see what I've got to work with. So on Monday after my classes were over, I drove up there and the trees were so tall and the, 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 it was, the woods were so thick, you can't even see the town. So I thought, oh no. So then I went to uh, the archives, to the archivists to talk about finding a picture that would be appropriate. We never found anything. 
at work, so luckily I had a friend with a small plane, Tom McIntyre, thank you so much. And Tom uh, buzzed me over at Bethany, and since he didn't know what it, the view and the direction, whatever, I had to keep telling him, and he brought Jake his dog, and we were all three in this small enclosure, dipping and twerking, and I'm like, ugh, I thought, oh no, because um, you can't roll down a window in an airplane. Uh, that's not a good idea. Anyway, uh, so uh, I took some pictures, and of course, this, it was uh, not automatic, it was an icon, I kept trying to focus, it. and I was getting sicker and sicker, and I thought, I cannot throw up on this plane. I just knew that, it wasn't going to work. So I said, okay, Tom, I, I think we're good now, I think we're good. So we left Bethany, flew over, and landed in the Wheeling Airport. It luckily, it wasn't all that far away. I managed to get out of the plane before being very sick. This is a print that I had created uh, to give to members of my class in the class of 72 as uh, favors if they came to Hong Kong. Um, on the piano here uh, are some pieces created by former students that honor me, uh, very different uh, techniques and, and directions for all these and uh, I want to this is Abby Otto and she is so good at uh, painting uh, pets in particular and uh, anyway and I'll talk about this in a minute I love this uh, Donovan Hayden um, did this piece that's in the back I don't know if you can see it at that angle but there it is this is Richard Strauss-Gould. Richard Strauss-Gould is paints icons and other things too, but he's especially fantastic at iconic things. He uh, lives in Germany and uh, has gone back to Germany to live after his four years at Bethany. We keep in close touch. I love him very much, and he's very special, a very special man. This is Matt Robinson, who uh, when I uh, went to part time or whatever, he. Uh, well, semi-retired. Matt was my adjunct professor in the classes, and this is his contribution. And as you uh, can see that I'm sort of uh, connected to um, Mickey Mouse. This is my secret. And, uh, this was a former colleague, actually, not a, not a student. John Gordon did this piece. One of my first students at Wheeling College, before I ever came to Bethany, is Michael Papa. And this is his forever pen USA stamp. Um, and then Eric Campbell came to the show and presented this to me, uh, Ken Skull. And uh, th there's one thing that uh, most of these have, and that is uh, some kind of attribution to Mickey Mouse and also some kind of uh, recognition of red glasses. <laughs> you never know what's going to stick with people. Back in this alcove, I have this triptych of the three graces. Um, this is very definitively a Ken Morgan style piece here. A triptych has three panels, okay? They're typically altar pieces, but not always. This is certainly not an altar piece, uh, but it fit there uh, beautifully and perfectly. I keep hoping that somebody will have like an indoor pool and, and a taste for, you know, some uh, humorous art and will say, I have to have that. But so far, it hasn't happened. If anybody's listening, let me know if you have a pool. Okay, I'm standing by this uh, parody of uh, Picasso's uh, Demoiselle d'Avignon. I've turned them into men, so they're Garçon d'Avignon. And um, what I want to say about this is uh, there's a term, horovacui. Horovacui is uh, Latin, I'm pretty sure, for fear of empty spaces. And I have a serious case, as anybody that's been to my home, or anybody that knows anything about me, or my offices, or whatever, I got horror evacuate big time. The fear of empty spaces is, uh, is because, and even cave people, way back, you know, 35,000 years ago, had horror evacuate when they were painting the cave walls, because if you've got too much space, an evil spirit can come and dwell there. And this, um, it, exists in Judy's bathroom in her home and it fills up pretty much a whole wall in her in her bathroom except now it's empty and now we have all kinds of horror vacuity in our house because when you look at this wall 
just imagine that many, many, many of these things uh, are here because they're not there. <laughs> and it's driving me crazy. If Jackson Pollock had ever painted a Mickey Mouse, it would look a lot like that. If Marcel Duchamp had ever painted a nude Mickey descending a staircase, it would look somewhat like that. Uh, this uh, is um, Monticello, and uh, well, enough said about that. And one of my favorite people, one of my favorite couples, one of my favorite families, has recently said they have to have this. And what a thrill. This has been uh, in a number of shows. Actually, I got this uh, uh, coat hanger in an apartment that I was living in while I was studying printmaking in Florence. And uh, it was just such an amazing, I mean, it's, it's almost like a piece of sculpture unto itself. And I thought, you know, and it fit in my suitcase. And I mean, it was, yeah, I, I don't think I was stealing anything of value, but anyway, maybe. I don't know, but I had to have. And the title is The Emperor's New Clothes. Now, I mean, some people haven't gotten it, but others certainly have. Um, and I just think, um, especially uh, for the times in which we're living, uh, and the medium here um, is uh, The Emperor's New Clothes, Velvet, Silk, and Gold Thread, 1995. Does that remind you of anybody? So this piece was inspired by Michelangelo's last sculpture. So the Sforzic uh, Castle in Milan, um, Italy, and uh, it, 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 he was working on it up until just a few days before he died. Michelangelo lived uh, until he was almost 89, which at a time when most people uh, didn't get past the mid-40s, they were thought of as old in the mid-40s. He lived a wonderful, uh, long, I don't know if that was wonderful, complicated, a uh, wonderful life. And, um, and he didn't finish it, and it's very, very rough and unfinished, and it's very, very powerful as a result of that. And I've only gotten to stand and walk around it once um, in my life, because I haven't been to Milan uh, very many times. I've been to other cities a lot more. Uh, I was actually uh, standing with my daughter Whitney when we were uh, taking this all in. So I painted this, and I used a, a, a verse from John 19, uh, 30. It is finished. Um, a pieta is any um, any depiction of Mary with her um, uh, dead son, and uh, that's what this is all about. And uh, so we're um, going now to see sort of uh, this piece I did in 2015, and the, the next piece we're going to see is the latest piece. I'm not sure if I've used the word zeitgeist earlier in this little talk, but I'm going to certainly use it now. Zeitgeist, in case you don't know, did I, did I, anyway, doesn't matter if I said it, I'm saying it again. Zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, um, art that really matters has captured the spirit of the times. It's what, it's, it's, it's the art that's in like Jansen's History of Art book. It's all that sort of stuff. And some things, you know, have zeitgeist and some things don't. But in this case, this is a Mary Magdalene. It's a wooden sculpture. It's in the museum, the Works Museum in Florence, Italy. And it's very powerful. It's made of wood, carved wood. And um, unlike the, the marble that Michelangelo uh, used. So this, this piece is unfinished. I guess you can tell that. I knew when I was, I've been thinking about this show for almost two years and what was going to be in it and what did I, because it's a retrospective, what did I have to uh, recollect and to bring back and whatever. Um, and uh, what did I have to, actually what did I have to take off our walls, which are fully decorated. And, and uh, but I had this piece in mind because if there's one piece that truly has zeitgeist involved, it would be this one. Because these times in which we're living are so complicated. And this is another uh, scripture verse from, from John, 2017. Noli me tangere, which is uh, uh, Latin, I believe, yeah, I'm sure, uh, for do not touch me. And I thought that uh, because of this pandemic, and because this is, by the way, 
my interpretation of the coronavirus, and these are my handprints. Because, you know, um, anyway, this is uh, Miriam of Magdala. And uh, so, so there's that. I've got a long way to go, but I'll, I'll get there. And at first I thought, oh, I can't believe I didn't get that piece finished. And I thought, wait a second. Maybe that's, maybe that's just perfect. Maybe that's just the way. I mean, because I'm not finished. This isn't finished. I don't know what's next. I don't know what I'm going to do here. And you should probably have blue gloves here. I don't know exactly. That. I'm sort of winding this up. I'm sitting in front of this wonderful, amazing piece of sculpture by one of my former students, Carl Cosentino, and I just uh, I love him, and I think this is a, a very, very special. In my uh, last lecture on a Sunday, there there were some things that I really because it was I was nervous. It, it was uh, overwhelming emotionally for me. And, uh, and there are some things that I, uh, I should have said and, and I didn't. And one of those is um, the fact that I wouldn't be here without Helen Owens, um, who uh, became, well, she wouldn't, Helen Owens lived in Bethany, outside of Bethany, with her husband on kind of, I would say, I would say a farm. And she worked for the college, she worked in the snack bar. She was sweet and sweet and sweet. and. Um, and she invited, she was, I, I was leaving here. I wasn't going to stay. I was miserable. And uh, I was going to go home for Thanksgiving, and I was not coming back. And she said, no, you, you've got to come back. And she, and we worked together in what was the beehive. It was a snack bar. And so she um, said, well, and my parents said, uh, Kenny, you can't, uh, you're not coming home because you only get uh, Thursday and Friday off, and of course the weekend to be back by Monday. And it's expensive because, you know, it's a flight to Portsmouth from Pittsburgh. And so that wasn't gonna work. And so Helen said, well, you're gonna come and have Thanksgiving at my house. And so it was Helen, and it was a wonderful, it was a beautiful Thanksgiving. I met her husband, I met her daughter, Linda, who is almost identical to, in sweetness terms, to, to her mother, Helen, and, and her brother. Uh, was also a part of that Thanksgiving. And uh, that is Linda's brother, not Helen's. And um, so I just, I, I'm so sorry that I omitted that because truly, we never know who's gonna be that person that is going to truly change our life. And I would like to think that I've been somewhat successful in that regard with my students. I hear wonderful things frequently um, and that means so much to me. And um, one of the things that I uh, liked about uh, rereading and reading the uh, Tuesdays with Maury uh, book and uh, Maury in his own words is that uh, it was quite obvious that Maury was um, not going to be around very much longer. And so they were talking, he was talking about death with Mitch and whatever. And he said to um, Mitch, so um, when I'm gone, what I would like for you to do is to come to my grave and, um, and talk to me. And, and uh, Mitch says, well, what should I say? I'm not doing a very good job of this. What should I say? And he said, say, say anything. And, and, he's, and because Maury says, uh, say anything because I'll be listening. And um, so I was hoping I would have <laughs> escaped this part, but clearly not. So here's the thing, former students. I have the honor of having a grave identified up in the uh, Campbell Cemetery, which is quite an honor. You have to qualify and stuff to, to be up there. And I haven't put a tombstone up there yet, but someday there will be one, a long time from now, but uh, there will be one. And so uh, when, when anybody that took a class with me or knew me in any way, shape or form, when you come back to celebrate a reunion or come back to share Bethany with your family, this gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful campus, then what about that idea? I mean, I, 
I have a, a grave actually in Portsmouth, Virginia, but nobody knows me there anymore, and so nobody's going to go in. So, and, and, but here's the thing that Maury said uh, to, to Mitch. Put out a little blanket and just uh, sit there and remember me and talk to me and tell me what's going on with you. So the only difference that I would say, um, I'll be cremated, so there'll be ashes down there, there'll be ashes here, and perhaps if I get my way, there might be a, a tablespoon or two in the Arno River or someplace like that. Um, so uh, again, I don't want to be morbid. I don't feel, I'm, I'm not worried. I, I, I believe in, I strongly believe in reincarnation for that matter. So, so um, nobody's going to get rid of me anytime soon, I suppose. But. Um, Back to the point, bring, bring a little beverage of some sort with you when you come up there. And, and you're, you'll see my stone, it's going to have my name on it. I haven't, it hasn't been made yet, I haven't purchased it yet. It'll, it'll, be, um, it'll be there and look around till you, till you see it. It's not a huge cemetery, so that shouldn't be very hard. And then, um, you know, just pour a sip or two on, the, uh, on the, my stone of, of whatever that is that you decided to bring. Well, anyway, thanks. Uh, if, you, if you're not asleep, <laughs> if you haven't fallen asleep yet, uh, or hit pause or whatever, I, I don't know how much sense this made um, overall. Anybody that knows me, um, let me know uh, how you're doing, where you are, and come see me sometime. Uh, not just up there in the cemetery, but you know, wherever I'm 